Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary Baptist Church in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Today, we are looking at what the Bible says about divorce. We will look specifically at Paul's letter to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. You can follow along with the Life Notes by downloading them at calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here's Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7, if you don't... uh, have a Bible and you're in one of our campuses, then uh, you can grab one of the Bibles and around you. If you're at the Sweetwater campus, if you're at our Parker campus, then there's a table right back in the middle of the room. Jump up right now, go grab one of those Bibles and uh, then turn to page 1135 and you'll be able to follow along with us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I I I love the looks on people's faces when they're like, this is not normal. (laughs) This is unusual. Look, there... There's people up there with Pastor Chad. What's going on? Anyway, so, uh, hey, that's true. But we want you to grab a Bible. And by the way, if you're at any of our campuses and you need a Bible, want a Bible, take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, message us. We'll get you a Bible. Because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh... Last week, we talked about marriage and intimacy. And uh, and we discussed how to build a marriage relationship that's going to be blessed by God. But where there is marriage, there is divorce. Because we live in a broken world. And so I thought, if I'm going to preach on divorce, if we're going to talk about that, then I'm going to invite a a panel of experiential experts to, uh, to join me in talking about how, uh, you know, God deals with us in this situation. So let me introduce the panel real quick, because you guys are wondering who these people are, or maybe you know some of them are going, oh, I like them. They sing or whatever. So uh, Rick Childers is on the end, and Rick is our future Lake Havasu City North Campus pastor. He's in the process right now of applying with uh, our mission board and everything to, to do that. So uh, you see Rick from time to time emceeing here on stage, and he's involved in helping us uh, figure out how we're going to expand on the north side where they're doing all that building. So Rick, glad to have you. And then next to Rick is Kathy Simons. Uh, Kathy was actually uh, a member of Calvary before I came uh, here as pastor. And so she's been around a long time, a lot longer than me. Well, a couple years longer than me. And, uh, and for those of you who are like, how long is that? 33 years is how long she's been here. And, uh, and she's our office manager at Calvary. And then this is Jamie Morris. You guys might have seen her singing. Jamie is on our worship team, but she's also our worship arts volunteer coordinator. So if you've ever thought like, hey, I want to sing up there. I play an instrument or I want to help do the tech talk to Jamie after the service. She would love to sign you up. You may want to talk to any of these after the service. They'll be available hanging out here at the front with the prayer team uh, as well. But today we're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, same place we were last week. We talked about marriage. And and today we're going to talk about divorce from God's perspective. Now, I, I lean into the God's perspective because I grew up in Baptist churches and they talked about divorce from their perspective. Not God's perspective. I, I grew up in churches that treated divorced people as pariahs, as second-class citizens, as people who <laughs> might as well, they were spiritual lepers. You know, they were welcome to come to the church, but we're not going to let them do anything. We're kind of embarrassed by them. And, uh, and I'm just going to say that's not what God intended. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 10, I just want to read a few of these verses. Uh, So you can get a little bit of perspective as Paul addresses the church in Corinth. He said, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. I'm really not gonna lean into that, so just, uh, you can, you know, ask me later about that one. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved 
God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Now, as we begin this discussion, first of all, let me just acknowledge that God's plan for marriage is one man, one woman, one lifetime. Okay, that's God's intention. Now, again, I just got to be clear, this is for Jesus followers. This doesn't apply to everybody's standard. I mean, it's God's plan to bless you, but this is for those of you who believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, who believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. But even if you don't yet believe in Jesus, if you follow God's plan, it will bless you. Now, this is God's ideal plan to bless us, our children, and our society. But of course, we live in a sin-filled world, and ever since the first family rebelled against God, it has adversely impacted every relationship on earth. So we know what God's plan is. And by the way, here at Calvary, we believe that God can redeem and restore any family. Okay, we're incredibly pro-marriage, and we just want you to know that. That's what God does. He redeems. But we also understand that instead of being the intimate, loving partners that God intended for us, we now live in a world where men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Okay, we, we get the brokenness. And, and that's really the second point I need to make is we know what God's plan is, but our rebellion results in brokenness. Okay, our disobedience to God results in brokenness in our life. So we reject God's authority and his plan. We fail to obey. We choose defiance and we reap what we sow. So our rebellion results in brokenness. And because of that, our relationships suffer. We experience pain, sorrow, frustration, all of that leading to divorce. Now, the prophet Malachi, he wrote a book in the Old Testament. You can look it up and find it if you want to. He says, God hates divorce. And, and that verse has been used by churches for a long time uh, to kind of just tell people, you know, that's not an option because God hates it. I think the reason God hates divorce is the pain and loss and suffering that sin brings into the families that God wants to bless. Okay, so second point is our, our rebellion results in brokenness. And, and the truth is nobody wants a divorce. Nobody wants to go through the pain and the heartache and the, the, just the heartbreak of being a failure. And, and there's not a single person I know that I've ever talked to that ended up getting a divorce that ever said, I want a divorce. But divorce is where our rebellion leads us. It's what happens uh, really as the final step of rebellion. Uh, you know, uh, I grew up in churches where when you got divorced, it was like, oh, you just committed the unpardonable sin. They didn't say that, but they acted like that. But here's the thing. Divorce is the final act of our rebellion because our rebellion starts in the way that we date. Anybody want to confess? No, I don't have to ask you right now. But it, it starts there. I mean, because we don't even think about following God's rules. We just kind of do it our way. And, and, and then we decide we're going to get married. And then the values that we choose in our marriage don't reflect God's values. And, uh, and so it doesn't bless our marriage. And then, of course, we've got the lust and perversion of uh, infidelity, the pain that that brings. Uh, we choose not to put God at the center of our marriage, you know, because there's so many other things we want to do. We include God, but we don't actually let him rule our lives and our marriages. And we do all that, and then we wonder, why do we get divorced? It's just the final step, step of our rebellion in, in our, our relationships. relationships. It's not the first act of rebellion, it's the final one in that marriage. So our rebellion results in brokenness and that causes pain at a very personal level. As I shared, I've got uh, my friends here who are experiential experts and I, I just asked them if they would kind of come and, and tell their story and they're gonna tell it in two parts so they don't think, why did they stop there? Uh, so would you guys mind sharing the pain of your marriage uh, that ended in divorce? Uh, Rick, would you go first? Yeah, I, um, I grew up in church, so, um, but I'm from a broken home. My parents divorced when I was three years old, and that divorce happened between two good church-going people. So um, it happened in the church, and uh, growing up in a broken home, uh, I realized firsthand why God hates divorce, because everybody gets hurt, especially the kids. 
And uh, that's exactly what happened. And throughout uh, that whole time, you know, I got to live in a house where there was a lot of resentment, a lot of bitterness, a lot of name calling, uh, just a lot of pain. But those emotional wounds and those relationships never got dealt with. It's easy. Uh, that's what church is all about sometimes. And that's why they have Sunday night services, because when you have problems, you can just go to the altar and pray about it. And then you're good for another week. That's kind of how it was in my household. And I knew Jesus, but I knew Jesus as the guy that was going to keep me out of hell for what I did wrong all week. As long as I prayed to him every Sunday, that's kind of how that went my entire childhood. Uh, divorce, my parents' divorce was a big thing. So here I am growing up thinking, well, that's the last thing I want to do is get married and go through this again. Uh, but growing up in the church as a teenager, God really got a hold of my life and called me into ministry. So uh, my relationship with Jesus was very important. Met a, met a nice girl in youth group who'd be a good pastor's wife. So thought, hey, you know, this will be a great thing. God's called us into ministry. Let's do it. Um, but again, never dealt with our issues. So here now, um, here's a married couple now <laughs> with those same issues, but now we're doing ministry. So it was kind of like, well, I prayed about this and, you know, God didn't say no, he's allowing this. So what could go wrong? I'm sure, uh, I'm sure it's going to be okay. So here we go. So we did that for 25 years, had a good ministry, pretty good life. But every time issues would come up with the stresses of life, it was very easy to just push it back down and go into another service or another act of ministry. And that was just what we did. Never dealt with issues, always just went to church and lived the Christian life until 25 years later, my life decides she doesn't want to do that anymore and uh, decides she wants to get out of ministry. So now she's taking the call of God from my life. It's a very selfish thing. What about our income? What about a career? And I'm like, what am I going to do? She's like, well, get a real job. And I'm like, Amen. I, I thought I had a real job. <laughs> oh, sorry. Isn't this a real job? So I, I was just in a world of hurt and bewildered. And of course, at that point now, without any resolved issues, guess what happens? I become resentful and angry and very bitter toward her. And now I'm becoming emotionally distant, thrown in with a little passive aggression for punishment. And that's kind of how that went outside of ministry while I was trying to figure my life out for about three years until she just decided, hey, you know, that resentment and passive aggressiveness and that anger just doesn't work for me at all. So she uh, got on Facebook and uh, found somebody who would give her the attention and the emotional connection she needed. And pretty soon I'm getting served divorce papers. So all of a sudden it's like, man, here I am a washed up pastor with a failed marriage. And this is the life I'm living now. How did I get here? So I spent uh, quite a bit of time just living that guilt and that shame and beating myself up. I'm a washed up pastor with a failed marriage. And that's just my life now. And now I had to realize I'm that guy. I'm that guy I never wanted to be, living the life I never wanted to live. Thanks for sharing that, Rick. I appreciate that. Kathy, what's your story of pain? Well, I married my high school sweetheart, and I also grew up with him in youth group. And we got married two months after I graduated from high school. And shortly after we got married, um, he stopped going to church altogether. Um, he stopped coming home at night after work a lot. Um, I was married to what I found to be a very emotionally, uh, mentally, um, and verbally abusive man. Um, we stayed married for 26 years, and um, I was beat down pretty much every day. Um, I heard words called of me that I had never even knew existed, nor did I ever expect someone that loved me to call me that. I was told that no one else would ever want me. Um, the reason I stayed with him was because I didn't want my children on welfare. We had three daughters, and I thought, I can't financially take care of these kids by myself, so I thought, I'll stay with him and make it work, um, which in hindsight, I wish I wouldn't have done, because it's caused some issues in my girls. Um, I felt like a failure. 
In fact, to this day, my parents still don't know why I got a divorce because to me, I failed. I felt my self-worth was nothing. Um, I felt it was my fault because I was told that every day. I went to church. I never stopped going to church. I was a Sunday school teacher. I went to every Bible study I could think of that would change me because I felt like I did something wrong. And so... um, My ex-husband also kept me isolated. I wasn't really allowed to have people over to the house, friends or family, um, unless it was a special occasion. And if I'd go anywhere, I knew when I came home I had something to pay for. And so I was always sick to my stomach as I'd head home, or I would be sick to my stomach when I knew he was coming home because I didn't know what kind of a man was going to walk through the door. So I was always kind of scared of that. Um, When my youngest daughter went to college, I decided I was done with this, and I needed to do something with myself, and I knew that God loved me and I had worth. And so I went to Chad and sent my ex-husband to Chad for counseling. I went to a lady counselor, but everything Chad told my ex-husband not to do to me because he loved to threaten me, um, he would do. So pretty soon it was pretty obvious that it was time to call it quits. And so I served him with divorce papers. And um, the hardest part, the most painful part of the whole thing was that, like I said, I was always in church. And my kids were always in church. The minute I filed for divorce, my ex-husband started coming back to the church. And he went to the leaders. He went to the deacons. He went to my friends. He went to my coworkers, because I was working at Calvary and started spreading horrible lies about me. And the most painful thing was that they all believed him and started coming to me and telling me what a wrong thing I was doing and how I shouldn't be getting a divorce from him. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate that. Jamie, tell us a little bit about your story. It's probably a little different than those two. Um, It is a little bit different. I want to start by saying this feels a lot different than singing on stage. (laughs) Not not nearly Um, as scary for me. Oh, it's totally scary for me. So um, I grew up, um, my, my, both of my parents were believers. Um, My dad has always said he was um, Catholic, but there was no practicing of any religion within our home. Um, or no open practice. Um, my dad did the pray, pray at night when you go to bed thing, um, and, and that was good enough. So um, I did not really know who God was, um, and no one had ever really told me um, the importance of biblical values or anything like that. So um, I carried a lot of trauma from my childhood into my young adult life, and um, I got pregnant at a very young age. I was 17 years old when I got pregnant with my first son. Um, and I had him uh, at 18. And at the same time that I was about to give birth to my first son, I went through a very serious breakup and my heart was broken. And um, so I decided that what I needed to do was marry someone who was exactly the opposite of that person. <laughs> and, um, and, and I mean, I, I really believed that that would be the answer. I really believed that that would be the solution. And so um, I, I found what I thought was that person and I jumped into my first marriage. Um, we did not uh, go to church. We did not talk about God. Um, he was not a believer. And I wasn't even sure I was a believer, really. I, I didn't really have any foundation um, in God. So um, all the normal life challenges, financial challenges, um, you know, everyday aggravations, uh, they were a lot different in my first marriage than I experienced today as I walk through life. Um, there was no God to hand things over to. There was no God to surrender to. There was no God to bring your problems to. Um, you brought your problems to each other, and sometimes it wasn't pretty. Um, and because of that, um, or you know, within the context of that marriage, I also started my very heavy addiction to opiate medications, um, which was just like fuel on the fire. Um, and so uh, I, I got out of that first marriage still in my addiction. Um, my second marriage was a quick trip to Las Vegas because that was going to be the answer. And, um, and that marriage did not include God either. There was no, uh, found it, no healthy spiritual anything. Um, there was a, a lot of drinking on one side and a lot of drugs on my side. Um, 
and neither one of those things mix well. And, um, and because of that, um, while I was in rehab in 2015, I decided to divorce and try to give myself a real shot um, without without pain and, and toxicity. And so um, I did that. Now, after those two divorces, I decided I don't, I don't wanna ever get married again. I just wanna live my life and, and I don't ever wanna do that again. Uh, uh, the pattern had taught me that this was gonna be painful and to just steer clear of it. And, um, and, and so I lived that life that you were talking about where it starts in dating. Mm. And I did not live a biblical lifestyle. In fact, I am a baby Christian. Um, I just gave my life to the Lord in 2019. And even into my walk in the early part of my uh, relationship with God, I still carried in those worldly um, things. And uh, my husband now, oh, he's going to love that I tell this story. Um, sure, okay, so. For the next part? Yeah. Oh, you want me to save it for the save next part? For the next I can part. do Let's that. Let's get okay. there. It's, not, yeah. it's too much fun for this part. Deal. Because you guys just, <laughs> hey, thank you guys for sharing your pain. I know, I know you weren't looking forward to that, but you uh, agreed. So thank you. But I want to tell you guys and, and everyone who's listening, God redeems our failures. Yeah. Okay, God redeems our failures. And, and this may sound crazy. Actually, the churches I grew up in would probably sound like heresy. But divorce can be part of God's redemption in our lives. Okay, you, I just read a few moments ago, 1 Corinthians 7.15. It says God doesn't want us to be enslaved. Talking about, hey, if, if, you're, if your spouse abandons you, you're free. Uh, Matthew 19, uh, the, the religious leaders were challenging Jesus. And it says they said to him... Why then did Moses command one of us to give a certificate of divorce and to send her on her way? Send your wife, divorce your wife. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. So get this, God hates divorce and God permits divorce. He permits divorce because he knows our hearts are hard mm -hmm. and he doesn't want us to be enslaved. I, I mean, that's the, the message that Paul is saying. Hey, God doesn't intend for you to be enslaved. So if one spouse is unfaithful, God does not demand that you live with a cheat. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, hey, you have to stay. He doesn't say you have to go, but he says, hey, if you don't feel like there's trust and, and that can't be, then you're not mandated to live with a cheating spouse. If one spouse abandons the family, then the other is not sentenced to loneliness for the rest of their life, not enslaved. If one spouse just gives up, is abusive, chooses addiction, well, then God offers a second chance. See, that's what redemption can be looked like. Like, in fact, divorce can be God's way of saying, I didn't create marriage to punish you or force you to live in misery. Okay, uh, if, if the marriage vows are broken, and, and, and that's always the place I, when people come to me and I go, were the vows broken? And, and scripturally, the vows are abandonment or adultery. Personally, I add abuse and addiction to that because that's also breaking the vows. You're choosing somewhat, something else over the family or you're choosing to not protect, you made that vow. So, uh, so if one partner has a hard heart, God gives an out. Okay? If one partner refuses to uphold the vows, God gives an out. And, and in that, God is redeeming our lives if we follow him. Let me say that. If you want God to redeem your life, then you have to surrender to him and say, I'll do it your way. Uh, and if we live God's way, then God works miracles in our lives. And, and I think all three of these friends sitting here have seen some miracles happen in their lives. So Jamie, uh, you want to pick up with how has God redeemed your life as you surrender to him since you're about to tell a really fun uh, story that <laughs> Mike is not going to like. I don't think he won't like it. He'll just not be excited that I told it. <laughs> um, uh, like I, I was saying, uh, I carried a lot of um, worldly views into my um, starting, uh, uh, Michael, my husband, and I starting our relationship. Um, in fact, I can remember um, driving uh, here from Kingman to move in and, and saying, are we about to commit sin? 
And my, my husband now said, you know, back in the Bible days, they didn't really have ceremonies. A man just decided that a woman was his wife, and, and I went, works for me. And, and, and I carried that with me, okay? And, and, and I mean, that's really what happened inside of me. I was like, I mean, that sounds, that works for me. And, and we went, you know, forward like that. And I became a worship leader at Calvary Church, and um, it was maybe eight or nine months in. Um, my, the leaders here at church actually did not know that we weren't married. And that's a biblical value that I did not understand had importance. I knew that the church says you should be married, but um, to, un to fully understand in your heart the value of that biblical principle is different than knowing you've heard something. And, um, and so we have really phenomenal leaders at this church who want to see us um, walk well with the Lord and in relationship to him. And so... Um, our amazing worship pastor and his wife, um, we all sat down and, and they just asked the question, you know, like, why haven't you yet? And I had all the worldly excuses as to why. Um, but when I, I'll tell you this, when I walked away from that meeting, I felt so heavily on my heart that God was calling me to step into obedience instead of living the way that I was. And so um, I had a conversation with my husband and I said, we need to get married. And he's like, we have a plan. And I said, then we need to be celibate. And he went, what? <laughs> you can't change that just like that. You can't do that could ruin us, right? And these are valuable thoughts that, I mean, these are real thoughts that my husband was having and he's not wrong. When you're stepping from worldly into obedience, there is gonna be some hardship and some fight and there was, but we made a decision that we wanted to do what God was, I mean, God was, I could not avoid what God was putting on my heart. If I had not done what God was telling me to, I would have felt it deeply for the rest of my life. And so, um, you know, we, we said, we're gonna be obedient. This is either gonna destroy us or it's gonna be amazing. And so we stepped into obedience and we had a plan to get married uh, in March when my um, a wonderful stepson got home from the Marines and um, a situation happened that would potentially push his date out to come home. And um, I, my husband was a little frustrated and, and I said to him in the kitchen, do you wanna run away and get married? And he said, call Pastor Chad. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so I did, and, I, and Pastor Chad said, I will marry you guys at worship practice on Saturday. And so, and, and my husband does not like being the center of attention, so it was perfect. It was me and him and his you know, parents and our children and, um, and Pastor team. Chad and the worship team, so it was very small and, and he didn't have to be the center of attention. And the, the most amazing blessing in that situation was, um, that was December 5th, and um, my beautiful mother-in-law uh, died um, in the hospital from uh, a disease that was out at that time. And um, that was in February. And we had planned to get married in March and she would not have been there. Um, and I, so I, M Michael and I both feel very deeply that God put it on our hearts so heavily so that we could experience, you know, mom being a part of that. And um, living in a marriage that puts God at the center is so different than what I've experienced before. I was concerned constantly about, was I good enough? Or will he leave me? Or will he cheat on me? And all those feelings existed inside of my relationships before. And I feel none of those things. When I'm concerned about what God's calling me to do, my husband tells me, you better pray and find out. You know, He's encouraging to put God in the center of our marriage. And so, the health and vitality that exists by placing God at the center is far different than what I had before, which was bound to end in divorce because God was not a part of any of those things. Amen. So. Amen. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Kathy, how did God redeem? Okay. Um, I was one of those ones that said I would never get married again because I did not want to ever go through that again. Um, but I had a Michael in my life. Um, Mike and I were friends for over 30 years, and my girls actually were his girls' babysitters growing up. So when um, we decided to get married, and we've been married 18 and a half years now, um, our families melded together just naturally. It was, there was no issues there. Um, if you've ever been part of emotional and uh, verbal abuse, that stays with you for a lifetime. So it's a, a thing that never goes away, 
But Mike was so encouraging. Um, he put up with a lot, a lot of nightmare nights where I'd wake up having nightmares. Um, a lot of trust issues on my end. Um, but God gave me a really good man that I trusted. I knew his character, and I knew that he'd be good for me. Um, God made a big change in my life a year and a half ago. Um, I was always still sick to my stomach and afraid to go out of the house for I don't know why. But um, a year and a half ago, um, I had made a promise to my girls when we got divorced, and I said I will always be there for your dad because um, they live out of state, and so they didn't want him to ever be alone if something drastic happened. And a year and a half ago on Christmas Eve, um, I got a call that they were going to intubate him. He had COVID, and um, so I ran down to the hospital here in Havasu and ran into the room. They all waited for me for the procedure, and I walked in, and these nurses that don't even know me and knew I was the ex-wife, this nurse looks at me and said, would you like to pray with him? And I'm like, okay. So I prayed for him before they intubated him, and I talked to him about going to be with Jesus if that was God's choice. And um, a week and a half later, I stood there for seven hours holding his hand and talking to him as he went to be with the Lord. And to me, that was freeing because I felt like I was finally able to forgive him I was finally able to know that I'll, um, this sounds harsh, but I knew I would never be hurt again. And it was just a good experience for me personally to start growing. So now I'm still in counseling. I'll probably always be in counseling. I'm still trying to find my self-worth, but God finally gave me a voice and I use it often. Chad will attest to that. Amen. And um, Amen. I feel like God loves me, I know God loves me, and I know that I am worth a lot to Him. Amen. Amen. All right, Rick, you're a washed up pastor who is that guy. So how did, what how is did a God washed redeem? Up, what does a washed up pastor with a failed marriage who just lost everything do? Well, he does some self-evaluation, so that's exactly what I did. I went through a period where I realized um, life was not working out for me, but I was a Christian, so what was going on? And what I realized was a lot of my relationship with God was actually wrapped up in the church and was wrapped up in my traditions and religious stuff that I've always been taught. And I really needed to clear all that junk out. So I went through a period where it was just me and Jesus, and that's all I wanted. Mm. I didn't want to hear anything about the church. I had to work through what the Bible actually says versus what my church tradition says. And I just went through a period where it was just about Jesus. It was me and him, and we had some long, serious talks, and they weren't all good, and they weren't all nice. <laughs> But uh, through that, I, you know, and getting into God's word, it was very freeing because, of course, as you could tell, probably, you know, my wife had a lot of things to say about me and who I was. And church people could think things and say who I was. But you know what mattered? What mattered is what Jesus said I was and what God's word said about me and what God's plan for my life was. And that just really helped me through that time. And as I began to heal, um, my real job at the time uh, was selling RVs. So I had just made a move to an RV dealership and I was calling my clients and texting them and saying, hey, I moved from here to there and, and uh, texted Lori. Lori uh, was a friend of mine for 25 years that we'd met in the church and I knew her family, um, but we got a little bit disconnected, but now I was just calling everybody. So I called Lori and said, hey, you know, I'm over at this RV dealership. She calls me back and says, I want you to sell my fifth wheel. So I started talking to her, hey, what's going on in your life? She's like, I just got divorced. And so I'm like, whoa. So I'm like, well, Lori's free. And I've always admired her and respected her, even in her relationship that I'd known of that wasn't good. She was always so kind and just always had nothing but good things to say to each other. She had such a tenderness and a kindness and a love for the Lord. I just always respected her and thought, you know, Lord, I promised myself I'm never getting married again, but I'd marry Lori, and if she's available. Um, so we just started talking, and pretty soon, 
Um, we got together and then we got married and of course I'm still beat up and we're living up in Bend, Oregon and um, Lori says, hey, I don't like the cold. I want to go down to Havasu. So I'm like, all right, I'm from California. Let's go. So we ended up down here. We started going to Calvary. And again, I'm still pretty beat up, but I started hearing about things that I normally didn't hear in the churches that I was involved in. I was started hearing things that didn't have anything to do with church growth and getting people in the door, or getting ties or any of that. I started hearing about having a true life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. It was what I knew, but it was what I needed at the time because I needed a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. So that started happening. I started, um, you know, getting free from stuff. And I, the best thing I did, you guys, is I got involved in a life group. And I love my life group. Those people are the most awesome people I know. Um, We get together every every week and we get real and we pray for each other and we do life together. And they're like family now. And and I just love them and and couldn't live without them now. And it's the the best part about this whole experience here at Calvary for me. And I, I was in a life group at the time and Chad and Marilda were in the group. And I was telling my story couldn't believe what happened to me. How'd I get here? And, you know, I just, I just couldn't believe it. And Morelda just kind of looks at me with that look and goes, well, Rick, you know God redeems and restores. And I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, that's one of those uh, dumb moments. I should know that by now. <laughs> and so I just started thinking about that. And all of a sudden, through that, realizing that, yes, God knows that I was going to be human and I was going to have some mistakes and failures. And he'd factored that in. Yeah. And he still had a plan for my life. That's why he sent Jesus, because he knew I'd need a savior. He knew I'd need a healer. He knew I'd need a redeemer and a restorer. And now here's the moment, the aha moment, where that's happening. And now Jesus I knew all my life is the Jesus that's healing and restoring me. And uh, so here we are. We're there. And um, so all of a sudden, all my hope comes back. My dreams that have died actually started coming back ministry opportunities started coming back. And so Lori and I are just really grateful to be where we're at and having a chance to finish right. Yes, I made some mistakes in the first half, fumbled the ball a few times, but nobody really cares what the score is at halftime. The only thing that matters is that you finish well. So we're on track now to finish well. Amen. And we're excited about God's plan for our life now in the second half. Hey, you know what? Uh, you can certainly tell that he's a pastor. <laughs> and he's definitely not washed up. So uh, uh, thank you all for sharing. I uh, appreciate that. Yeah, give him a hand. Hey, I just want to remind you, God still hates divorce. And he wants to redeem and restore your marriage. Uh, whatever condition it's in. Uh, and, and God can redeem your life if both of you will surrender and follow him. I'm just yes. telling you that right now. Uh, but no matter your choices, your failures, or your rebellion to this point in life, God loves you and can redeem you, and he can forgive you and restore you. That's right. So don't, whatever else you, you hear, understand there is hope for you, hope for your marriage, hope for your family. But the key point is this. You have to embrace God's plan for marriage, plan for your life. And the hardest part, and you heard him share, is letting go of those past failures and mistakes and seek Jesus for your future. So uh, just some real practical help. Uh, First of all, if you're struggling, you want help, uh, can I just encourage you to to get counseling? You heard Kathy talk about counseling. Uh, We've got counselors at Calvary. We've got counselors in the community that we partner with. We would love to help you connect to a counselor if you need counseling. We also have this ministry on Monday nights here at Sweetwater called Celebrate Recovery. And, uh, and it's not just for addicts and alcoholics. Uh, that's right. It's for all hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And, and if you want for a better pastors marriage... pastors don't know how to deal with problems and emotions. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So if you want a better marriage, be a better person. Yes. And that helps you be a better person. Uh, right. We've got a group called Divorce Care that'll be starting up in the fall. Look for that. And Rick already plugged life groups. Look, life groups are great for everyone. You sign yes. up. We'll start signing up in about three weeks for life groups this next session. And... Uh, say that if you're married, then you'll be around people who will support you and encourage you in your marriage. And if you're single, they'll be around people who will help you to live out godly singleness. So uh, look, a life of regret is a miserable trap. 
God wants you to live a life of hope, and he is the one who can help change your life if you will follow him. Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we confess that we need you. And we thank you for the stories that include both pain and redemption, because that's all of us. And God, you're the one who has redeemed us because you sent Jesus into this world to save us. Even while we were still rebelling against you, you demonstrated your love for us in this. Jesus died for us. So God, I pray that hope would just spring up in the hearts of those who are here, of those joining us online. And I pray that you would just do the miracles of life change, of redemption and restoration in us today. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. As Pastor Chad acknowledged, our rebellion results in brokenness, but isn't it great how God redeems our failures? I hope today's message provides you comfort that God has a plan for you. In an effort to encourage you in your walk with the Lord, we post daily three to five minute devotional videos on our Facebook and YouTube accounts. You can sign up to receive them by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash Devo. That's D-E-V-O. Well, that's all for today. Have a terrific week, and we'll be back next weekend. Bye-bye.